Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence once again by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful for the opportunity that you've given us again to just feast upon your word, to meditate on it, to think about it. I just ask that you would strip away all that which is error but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. We're looking at Romans part 43, chapter 7 overview. In these videos, if you haven't been studying along with us, we're in the epistle to the Romans verse by verse. And in our last study together, we were looking at the illustration that the Holy Spirit has given us in describing how that our being separated by death from law We've been joined together with Christ, the fulfillment of the law. It's a wonderful chapter, and I hope that you uh, who are following us along are being encouraged by it. Jesus Christ, whom God raised from the dead, the text mentions. And now we have, uh, we're, we're being introduced to the conflict that exists between the new man and the old man. Now, folks, as we've gone through the book of Romans, in, in chapter 1, we found that God's wrath is directed against mankind. That man is corrupt and has corrupted that which God has revealed to him. In chapter 2, we saw that man was inexcusable that man was a lawbreaker, totally and entirely. But in chapter 3, however, we found that that totally depraved person, none righteous, not one single one, there's none righteous, no, not one, yet we were justified freely by His grace, the word justification uh, is the word for righteous, freely by His grace, justified without a cause. The justification that isn't based on merit, but on grace. There was nothing in us, nothing which required God to declare us righteous. There were no reasons intrinsic in ourselves that compelled God to do that. It was God's love and God's grace. This is what we've been shown, and the fact that we were His before the foundation of the world. He declares that we were justified freely by His grace through the propitiation that's vested in the faithfulness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then we found in chapter 4 that we were called, we were called by the faithfulness of God. By His faithfulness, we were called that we are children of promise. That that, that call was not initiated by us, but by Him. That it was He who sought and redeemed His people. Lost sheep who were found. And in chapter 5, we found that we have peace with God. Therefore, having been justified by the faithfulness of Christ, we have peace with God. God has nothing against us. Not only that, but we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and we rejoice in our relationship with God, our, our peace with God. Imagine, there is no conflict. God has no cause against us. We shouldn't even think about whether we have any cause against God. God has no cause against us. We stand before Him, according to this book, we stand before Him every 
child of God stands before him, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. That stand is not there by human merit. We do not stand before God as righteous people because of anything we've done or of anything that we believe. We stand before God as righteous because he's made us righteous because of the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. That's what we've been shown. He who knew no sin was made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We saw that for by one man's disobedience we were made sinners in exactly the same way, in exactly the same way, by the obedience of the one, and we know that to be Jesus Christ, we're made righteous. We were not made sinners in Adam by choice. We were not made sinners in Adam by anything that we did. We were not made sinners in Adam by any elective choice. We were made sinners in Adam because Adam sinned. And in the same way, we are not made righteous in Christ because of anything we did or anything we chose to do or, or anything we thought or anything at all. We were made the righteousness of God in Christ. The second Adam, the righteousness of God in Christ because of his faithfulness, not our own, his faithfulness. And in chapter 6, we found the wonderful truth that we're dead to, to the law. We're dead to the law. If we're dead to the law, the law has no dominion over us. The law has no dominion over us. It has no claim against us. In fact, the law is not made for a righteous man. How can you be a lawbreaker when you're dead to the law? The result of that is that sin shall not, not hopefully it will not, but shall not have dominion over you. It does not have control over you. It may well direct the flesh, for there's nothing good in the flesh, but it has no dominion. It has no power whatsoever over you. Sin will not win. On the basis of the truth of the Word of God, your life is a life of victory and a life of triumph. He always causes us to triumph. If there's not victory, then sin wins. But sin will not win. In the sixth chapter, we not only find we were dead to sin, but dead to the law. Free from sin. Freed from sin. And now, here in the seventh chapter, we are being shown that in all of this grand truth, despite all that we've seen, there's still a conflict. There is a conflict between the righteous new man and the old man, the flesh. That the sin nature has not been eradicated. It's not been annihilated. What the text says is that it has been annulled. It will not have dominion over you. No matter how hopeless and how poor the situation may look, dearly beloved, we have victory. We are talking about God of very God. When God declares that he gives you the victory, he cannot lie. He can't lie. Think of what it would cost God, folks. If you are not absolutely righteous, you would only get what you deserve. There is not a one of you out there that not only deserves but has earned 
hell. Total banishment from the grace of God in the face of God. So, if it turns out that you do not have the victory, and, that you, and if it turns out that you don't triumph, and that you are not righteous in Christ, then God loses his reputation. God loses his honesty. He loses his righteousness, his justice. All you do is go to hell, which, well, that, that's where you ought to go anyway. Folks, our hope, our blessed hope, does not rest on us, but on him. He is our blessed hope. There are far too many Christians trying to trust in what they do. Their devotion, their dedication. You hear it all the time. It's all about that. It's all about their devotion, their dedication, their service. Modern Christianity is replete with appeals for service and little declarations of the glory and the majesty of our God. His grace and our triumph. Folks, I'm not in any way trying to minimize Christian responsibility. It comes on the shoulders of all of this truth that we've been presented. But believe me, I intend to maximize the person in the work of Jesus Christ. I would 10,000 times rather hear what Christ has done for me than what I ought to do for Christ. That's where our fellowship is. We don't fellowship in our own accomplishments. Once we come face to face with the beauty and the majesty of our Lord, everything else falls into place. And it is so easy, so easy, to depart from serious doctrine. We're surrounded with the conflict of a very intelligent society that calls into question the truth of this book, the deity and the majesty of our Savior, his real physical resurrection, literal resurrection from the dead, the very foundations of what we believe. We know that if Christ be not risen, we are of all men most to be pitied. So after all that has been revealed in just the first few chapters of this epistle, truths which should overwhelm our, our human thinking, we see that our God has recognized that we have a terrible conflict. He anticipated, he knew that we would come to know that we have a conflict despite all that, that we can't do what we would for the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh so that we cannot, cannot do what we would. The things I would not, these I allow, and what I desire to do, I do not. People read those verses and they say, well, that can't be true of the Christian life. That just can't be true. I'm going to decide to serve Christ, and I, I do. I serve him. I do exactly what I want to do. A minister told me that he hadn't, a minister told me once that he hadn't sinned in seven years. Uh, he didn't seem to appreciate it when I said, you just did. You are not free from the flesh. You are engaged in a bitter struggle, a bitter conflict. We're told that we should fight the good fight of faith. That's not a, a fighting the good fight in the flesh that we should be soldiers for Christ. And many, many people take those texts as, you know, you're going to go to Afghanistan or, or 
Iran, Iraq, or I'll go to Africa, China, or outer Mongolia, someplace, and fight for Christ. And folks, the great battle being presented, the, the conflict, the great battle that's being presented us here in this context is in yourself between the new you, the, the new man, and the old man. And that conflict becomes intense. Intense. The older I get, the more old men I talk to, the more I become aware of the, the horror of that conflict. And so many people say, well, it can't be. It just can't be. God can't love me. God can't look on me and see me as holy, righteous, and unblameable. He just can't do that. People who say that are walking by sight, not by faith. I mean, I mean, I, I can, uh, Steve, I can understand Paul, and I can understand Abraham, and I can understand Solomon, or David, or any one of the great saints of the Old Testament, but, but you know, they're not me. I'm no hero of the faith. I think every Christian at times looks at the horror of that old man and is tempted to say, it can't be. And that is because we have a frail understanding of God's grace. Folks, our God is gracious. Yes, he's a God of justice. Yes, he's a God of wrath. But that wrath and that justice was directed against Christ. We will soon be shown in Romans 8, verse 1, that there is therefore now no condemnation, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. None. None. that a righteous God cannot, will not, strike twice for my sin, once on Christ and once on me. Impossible. Therefore, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. None. Nada. Nothing. If God strikes you for sin, he has to strike Christ. He already did that. Jesus Christ died on the cross. If God strikes him for your sin, he's striking him twice. What does that remind you of? Moses. Moses struck the rock twice. Never entered into God's rest Moses belonged to God, but he never entered into God's rest. He never entered into the promised land. He struck the rock, and they had water to drink, but when he struck it the second time, he's now saying that, that, that God struck Christ twice, and that rock that followed them was Christ. So, in essence, Moses demeaned the service of Christ and exalted the actions of the flesh. So it's no wonder that God did not allow him to enter into his rest. Now Romans 8.1, if we leave out the chapter division, it's right when Paul declares through the leading of the Holy Spirit O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Who? If it was up to Paul, if it was in Paul to do that, the, the question of who would have never been asked. Our deliverance is through Christ, not ourself. The text is very clear on that. I believe chapter 7 is a marvelous revelation of the fact that we have victory despite the activity of the flesh, the old man, and that it is perfectly suited, perfectly suited to follow the six chapters that have preceded it. The grand 
declaration of the Holy Spirit is that now in the midst of that conflict, the horror of the old man wrestling with the new man, the Holy Spirit comes back with a resounding statement. There is now absolutely no condemnation, no judgment. But we're not there yet. We're not there yet. And I don't believe that we should leave chapter 7 yet. Folks, I'm keenly aware of the fact that what I have taught through this epistle is in direct conflict it's interesting with what modern conservative theology teaches I'm well aware of that fact but the theological position today conservative mind you not liberal conservative biblical teaching today gravely errs by saying you are declared righteous by God even though you're not righteous God just he just looks at you as righteous and, and so that, that's justification they call that justification to, to declare you righteous when you're not folks that's a position I cannot take that's not what the text says but whatever position you take on that will determine, that will determine how you come to understand what is being presented to us here in chapter 7. Dearly beloved, you had absolutely no synergism with God in regard to, to your justification. You're being born again, regenerated, born again from above by the will of God. You were born from above before you ever believed. Any conservative theologian worth his salt will absolutely agree that the faith that you exercise is the faith God gave you. You do exercise faith in Christ. But, but you exercise a faith that God gave to you, not a faith that you drummed up. You were born from above before you ever accepted Christ. Your destination in God's family had nothing, nothing to do with your choice, your acceptance, your belief, your repentance, or anything else. That is what modern Christianity fails to see. It is by the will of the sovereign God. You were born from above, and then you believed, and then you received, and then you repented, and on and on and on it goes. Yet these same conservative theologians who believe this firmly declare that God declared you righteous even though you aren't. You're not really righteous. He just looks at you like you are. Now, all of a sudden, you become a participant in the process, and we call that sanctification. So, you are working with God in your sanctification. You are working alongside God to help, well, to assist God in helping you become what, what, what you already are. You know, that there's less and less sin in your life as time goes by, and, and there's more and more righteousness if you work hard at it. Don't know how far you'll get before you die. You know, some of you will do a great job, and some of you won't. You know, some of you are doing a super-duper job. You know, and you can see the goal ahead of you. Won't be long, won't be long until you don't sin anymore. Or maybe you won't... You won't quite reach that goal. And any, any conservative theologian that's, that, that's worth his stuff will agree that you'll never reach it. But you're striving toward it. 
that old man is, he's trying to clean himself up. And you are becoming more and more set apart to God when you do. Folks, that's a lie. That's what they call sanctification. That's what they say sanctification means. The longer you live in your Christian experience, you just it's practice makes perfect. And folks, I disagree with that wholeheartedly. I believe God declared you to be righteous because in Jesus Christ, He made you righteous. And you were to walk that way. That's, the, that's where you start. That's not where you end up. That's where you start. And that there is absolutely no synergism between you and Christ and you becoming righteous. I am perfectly willing to agree that you can make a distinction. I'm going to set myself apart from God. Wonderful. Great. I, I, I would love to hear you say that. I wouldn't even criticize you for making that decision. I think it'd be wonderful to hear you say that. I think it'd be wonderful to hear you say, I really want to set myself apart for God, Steve. I do. I, want, I so want that. But that does not in any way mitigate or change the grand biblical truth that God sets you apart for him. Just as he set vessels apart in the temple, they were sanctified. Why? Because they were set apart to God. So God sets you apart unto him. You can look at that as a process of, of Christian development, but it doesn't change the truth that God sets you apart for him. Most of Christianity today labors heavily. I mean, it works hard at it in activities that it believes might make them what they fail to see that they already are in Christ. Oh, dear friends, don't let popular opinion or the traditions of men cleverly devised fables detract from the wonders of God's grace. Grace really does save. You are a new creation, and in God's eyes, you are wholly unblameable and unreprovable in His sight. As we come to see ourselves all too clearly in this conflict presented us in the seventh chapter, The question is one of, of who it is that is experiencing this conflict. Who's going through it? Just who is it that is struggling through it day after day, night after night, month after month, year after year? For, for all of the days that we are present in this body, would you not agree that it is of the utmost importance that we see ourselves as who we are in Christ as we endure this conflict that's being presented us here in this chapter? That it truly must make a difference whether we, we see ourselves as having been justified freely by God's grace, made the very righteousness of God in Christ. That we can't become any more righteous than what we already are in Christ. Whether we see ourselves as having died to sin and the law through the body of Christ. Whether we come to understand that that old man was crucified with Christ and that we have been buried with him, raised with him to walk in newness of life, his life, 
that the law has absolutely no place in the believer's life. That our struggle, the conflict, the struggle that, that we are being presented here, our conflict is not with the old man that was put to death with Christ. And that our deliverance is not found in our trying to clean up the old man, but in Jesus Christ. This is what our text is teaching us. It's not complicated. The problem is, is we don't study this. Do those building blocks that the Holy Spirit has presented us in chapters 1 through 6 leading up to this point, upon which Romans chapter 7 rests, do they matter to us? Because without it, when we remove that foundation, that foundation, which is Christ, everything that rests upon it comes tumbling down. It can't stand. It's like the house built on sand. Romans 7 is not a lesson on how we can somehow achieve the victory if only we apply ourselves enough. It is the exact opposite of that. Neither is it, as some suggest, an, an introduction into some area of victory that we will soon see brought forth in, in Romans chapter 8. Oh, well, Steve, it's, yeah, chapter 7 is the struggle and chapter 8 is the victory. No, folks, we had, the, we had the victory back in chapter 3. We've had victory since Romans chapter 3, justified freely by God's grace. We were led into to Romans chapter 7 already victorious. We were made victorious before we ever entered into the conflict of chapter 7. This is a summary of chapter 7 as I see it, folks. We've been released from the law through death so that we may bear fruit unto God we now serve God through the Spirit. The problem is not with the law, but with the flesh. The old man and new man will continue in conflict. This conflict proves victory is not achieved on a human level. But through Christ, deliverance is assured. And not even our will is capable of producing the result. Look, I love you all. I truly do. And I thank you. I appreciate every one of you for all that you do. This is Steve. Thanks for watching. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you once again for just giving us the opportunity to look upon your word, to think about it, to meditate on it. I just ask that you would filter out all foolishness and ignorance, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.